I think we're good. How's that looking for color and light? Uh, Sven, you want to go you take a... Or somebody? Do you just want to go stand at the podium? Here, I'll go there. Okay. It looks a little blue. Yeah.
Okay, that's good. I don't, I don't, I really don't know. I'm not a professional, but um, you can just come to the video with those fish. Is this baby's deep touch?
Check. Check. One. Two. Good to go.
standing, so if we end up having a bunch of fan awards, like, how many people? Yeah. So would you guys be willing to, like, get up and stand and, like, like, I'll get Nikki to say something, and then, like, once it gets full, and then she has to just get up and stand and not go
so significantly and so fundamentally, and where the resources that we enjoy belong to all of us. And how could it be that we simply just threw that away? And uh, we now, of course, as you know, uh, there are public hearings uh, that are sort of public, uh, theoretically, so they say, uh, excepting that the public's not allowed uh, even to observe. Uh, and of course, the most recent one to, uh, uh, in the interior, of course, was also canceled. Uh, so there is something really wrong in the process here as well. Uh, and so I want to um, really just say that uh, let us unite together. I thank the first people of this land for really leading the fight as well, uh, for all the people in this crowd. Uh, and I see people across communities, across generations coming together. And this is the one voice where we can um, send a, a strong message to the federal government, to our provincial government, uh, and for all of us to unite together uh, and do what is right for the present and for the future. So thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so looking forward to hearing the stories so that I can have, have that embedded in my heart, uh, in my soul, so I can relate those stories to my children, to the people in our community, to our friends, to my colleagues, uh, as we continue on uh, to do this uh, for generations to come. Thank you so much.
gallons of tar sand oil. And you will never ever understand how much one event in your world will change your life. So I was doing photography before this. I took cute little pictures of animals and birds and flowers, and I made cameras and uh, calendars and cards. Um, relaxation DVDs, okay? I was somebody retired from the airline industry. Let's see if this works. Um, again, Kalamazoo River, 2010, Enbridge Tar Sand Oil Spill. This is the first time I saw a boom. Um, and boom is what they put out to contain the oil. As you can see, it didn't work real well. We were at a uh, flood stage, a 50-year flood. flood. 1.1 million gallons of tar sand oil and counting. We know there's 300 to 800 acres of submerged oil, and that does not count the overflow areas where it flowed onto land that it is nowhere near the river, sometimes a quarter of a mile in. It impacted 40 miles. It basically went from land into a creek, went two miles down a creek and 40 miles down a river. And then it magically stopped at a lake called Morrow Lake because there's a dam there. It impacted the cities of Marshall, which is about 7,000 to 12, Soresco, which is a little village, about 800 people, Battle Creek, which is 50 to 55,000, Augusta and Plainwall are, are small villages under 1,000, and Kalamazoo, it varies because it's a university town between 25,000 and 100,000. This was the first day of the spell. Um, and I don't know how well it's showing up to you out there. Um, can you dim the lights? Yeah, can you dim the lights? Dim the lights. Um, basically, if you could see it really well, the darker areas are like black, black, black with sand in it. And this is where I lived, and that was 12.5 miles down the river. I lived six miles from the spill site, but as the river winds, it, it takes up mileage. So our mileage marker is 12.5 to 12.75. The lighter areas, which we went, ooh, look how pretty. And it, it, we knew it was like, it looked like gasoline in a rain puddle. We didn't know what we were really seeing. River's at a 50-year flood stage. Can you guys see the trees from this? No. no. Uh, Who's in charge of the lights? Come on. Turn on the lights. Um, I don't know. Can you still see it? No. Well, basically, it shows how high up on, on the, these trees that it went, and it was about what you guys would call a meter, a uh, yard in our language, well, three feet. <laughs> you still say yard. Do you? Oh, awesome. <laughs> this is Soresco Dam. This is the first small village that it comes to. It's a, t a little village of 800 people. Um, all of, all of the, People along this area, for the most part, had been bought out by Enbridge. It's a little wealthier. Um, a lot of people had very nice homes here. On the average, 250, between 150,000 and 200,000. On the right is my neighbor's tomato plant. It died within 24 hours. On the left, I don't know if you can see it, is it looks like green algae. Um, the river did not have a lot of algae before this spill. Um, and we're not quite sure why, but there's also animals that died very quickly. And that's what's in that photo. And then on the right hand side is more of that beautiful boom. Uh, 
the first meeting I went to was with the EPA and Marshall about eight days after the spill. They had our first community meeting and a little kid was standing out there holding the sign. And so I, I asked his mom what's going on and he wanted to clean up the animals. And what basically happened is we had a couple of organizations that were trained and had the approval to go in and take care of animals that were covered by oil. But Enbridge came along and said, don't touch an animal. If you touch one of these animals, we will have you arrested. We will take care of the animals. Now, I'm an animal lover, so I might not have listened to them. Um, and and the, uh, you would see citizens out there you know, with clothes baskets, putting geese or ducks or ducklings in it, um, and then they'd rush it to the proper area so they could try and save them. On the right is the sign um, that our health department finally put out about two or three days after the spill so people wouldn't go in the river. On the left is the first EPA meeting. And that's one of the things you get with an oil spill. You get to do community meetings like this. So this is good that you're doing it before the spill. <laughs> um, and that's, they had them in Marshall and they had them in Battle Creek and they'd have a little one in Soresco and one in Augusta. Um, and it was very interesting because if you went to all of them, you got different responses from the same people. On the right is, I lived in a small mobile home park of 81 families. When we finally got the attention of the health department, they came in and did what they call a sidromics. It's 10 questions. How are you feeling? Do you have headaches? It was, it was, it really was a ridiculous one. But they finally came in and they, they told our, our people. On the left is one of those turtles that might have gotten rescued that shouldn't have been because they weren't licensed to rescue them. Um, and on the right is, this is what happens to your world. Uh, that sign is literally across the street from where I used to do it. And they would hang the air monitoring uh, canisters on it. And you learn that you need the press. Um, basically, there was a couple of things that happened. Uh, we would not have been evacuated if it was not for this TV channel. And um, I uploaded to CNN and CNN Now I know they probably didn't want that on CNN. And, and the good thing was CNN ran my photos. Um, but this channel came and started interviewing the people with the sick children. So they can be your friend. No swimming, no fishing, no rowing. Um, you guys have the slogan, what? No, no pipeline, no tankers, no problem. It's a lot better than this one. <laughs> I love that one. You get to see your tax base disappear. This is an apartment complex that held about 280 families. Um, it was about a quarter of a mile up the river. It was low income. It had a lot of problems, uh, drugs and alcohol. About a month after the spill, it magically was closed by my city commissioners and county commissioners. They said, ooh, there's mold. There had been mold there for years. What they don't tell you is the oil spill 
they'll grow a lot. So they had a reason to close it. None of these people, and it's too, we're, we're still trying to locate them. None of these people were evacuated. None of these people were assisted. And all of these people were left on their own devices. On the right is U-Haul, and I had to ask someone, do you guys have U-Haul out here? Uh, that was the first movie truck in the little park I lived in. And I went running over and I said, are you moving? And they said yes, it was four days after the spill. They had been told by the EPA, get out, get out now. Because they had a little kid that was four years old. No, no one else in the park was told that. And if you went up and you asked while they were doing air monitoring, they would not give you an answer. And you get to watch the seasons go by. Um, here we are, two and a half years later. Um, <coughs> Battle Creek is famous for three things. Uh, Kellogg cereal, Post cereal, and we have a federal center there. Um, so you would think we would get lots of help. No. You get to meet great people, and these honestly are great people. Um, these people were going to Washington, D.C. to get arrested. And they, I, I came across them on a blog, and I thought, they're fighting this pipeline called the Keystone XL. I think they should come and see one. So I sent the young man on the left an email. Dear Mr. Gattis, please come to Battle Creek if you would like to see an oil spill. So they came. He's in Nebraska. The other two are in Texas. You might recognize the, the lady in the middle. That's Eleanor Fairchild. She's in her 80s. I'll be polite and not give it back years. She is one of my heroes. I have lots of heroes, but she's one of them. And um, she has been hit with three lawsuits by TransCanada to shut them up. The one on the right is David Daniels. He's hit with a a lawsuit to shut him out. You get to deal with health issues, and I don't know if you can see that. Um, it, it's basically a, a very bad rash. Um, we, we call them skin lesions, and it, it varied depending on the person and the age and how much exposure they have, uh, but it's it's very, very uncomfortable and nasty, and, and there's lots of health issues. Um, you get to deal with constant disruption of your life. Um, this is various types of food. Um, this was a section they were not even going to clean. It's a little outlet of the river. And they said, oh, we don't need to clean that. The river's not. There's no oil over there. Want a bed? <laughs> It was built, and they literally had to, the metal is, they are sectioning it off. They drained it completely and dug it out. But I bet I could still find it. You get to deal with boats, and you'll notice the number on the end. Uh, we forced Enbridge to start putting numbers on their cleanup boats because they would harass citizens that lived along the river. Um, and so we could identify them by the tail number. And you also get to deal with a helicopter every single day of your life during a cleanup. They are going to be going over your property, not just once a day, not just twice a day, probably three to five times a day. And then you get the airboats. They brought in a lot of cleanup people from Louisiana, because you know they have oil spills down in the, in the Gulf, they know how to clean them up. Well, if you've ever been near an airboat, uh, if if the end of it was here, it would blow the hat off the gentleman's head in the back, and it sends up a plume of, of spray, probably 20 feet every single day, and they would race up and down the river. 
and you get to see businesses close. This was a, a fish bait shop where you go get worms and stuff. It's been there since I was a child. The guy just completely rebuilt it, and he never got to open it because the spill happened the week before that. You get to deal with public officials. This is the Michigan Health Department, the Calhoun County Health Department, the Emmett Township Safety Department. The way we finally got them to come in and evacuate people, because I was calling everyone. I called senators, governors, uh, these people. You have to call the Michigan State Police to get evacuated. And you get to meet more officials and more officials. These are federals. Uh, you'll end up with about 18 to 20 federal government on it. And then you get to see people struggle and move away. Anyone want three lots on the river? And then you wonder what's going on. Uh, these were taken by a friend of mine. And this was taken in February, where it was minus eight degrees Celsius years. And we got the idea of doing this um, from a friend down in the Gulf. I said, well, you should do infrared because it shows up interesting things. So basically what that is, is where it's hot, is they are digging out the riverbed. That's the third time they've dug that area out. And for some reason, we don't think it's clean yet. You get to learn about chemicals. There's over 10,000 chemicals when you add in the tar sand and the dilutants. Um, so I just picked one, dichloromethane, but you get other things like toluene. Uh, it's very heavy in heavy metals. And you get to breathe them. And I don't think you guys can see it in that picture, but there's literally a haze over it. That's not day one of of that. That's like four months after the spill. And then you wonder what's going to happen in the future. And these are actually workers this past February. And that's the river. And it's minus eight degrees. And can you see the, these trees? These are the same trees that were in the beginning, so it shows how far the water was down. If you look up in the middle, that's one of my former neighbor's homes. And you get to say goodbye, because we have had several deaths. This gentleman left behind a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old. It's now been two years, so they're 16 and 18, respectively. He knew he was sick. He had just been diagnosed. But his goal was to live until the oldest kid was 18 so he could take care of the younger kid. Um, we had four deaths within the first year. The first two were women with compromised kidney and livers, and they died within two months. He was the third, and the fourth was a breast cancer survivor who had been in remission for six or seven years, and that was within the first year. I now have buried or said goodbye to about 17 people that I have met since the soil spill, because I knew none of these people. So that's one of the things that you need to learn, is when these spills happen, there's going to be consequences. Um, and so I dedicate it to those that are no longer with us. No pipelines, no takers, no problems. Remember the Kalamazoo River. We're not going away.
Takaya Blaney. She's a 12-year-old singer, songwriter, activist. Yeah. Well, it sounds like she's well known, so <laughs> without further ado. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay. So my name is Takaya Blaney and I'm 12 years old as of today. I'm from Simon Nation. Um, when I was nine, I wrote a song with my singing teacher, Eileen Bill Cruz, called Shallow Waters. And it was about a future where the Northern Gateway Pipeline where it spills on our coast. And it was about that future and reminding us that we don't want that future for them and generations to come and for our great-grandchildren. So I took the video and an open letter to Enbridge and it was turned away and then I spoke at the Enbridge shareholders AGM. It's funny, the first thing they opened up with was, despite the little mishap in the Kalamazoo last this year, we're doing great. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've traveled over Canada twice, um, and I've been speaking at rallies. And I speak about the dangers of this pipeline and saving indigenous cultures all over the world from unsustainable projects that would destroy indigenous cultures. I wasn't raised to be an activist, and I wasn't brought up to be an environmentalist. I was just taught to treat the earth the same way that we would treat our home, because it is our home, to treat the earth as our mother, because she feeds us and gives us home. I was told of the experiences of my kukba and my chichia, grandfather and grandmother, about the times when there were children my age, and then they would go down to the beach and slam it, and then they would eat the herring roe, and then they would eat the cockles and clams and mussels. And they were able to practice their traditions in a non-restrictive way that enabled them to practice the culture that's been passed down since the time of my ancestors' ancestors. But the contrast from now, um, from three generations ago, only three generations ago to now has warped and changed so dramatically. That same beach where they were able to fluently practice their culture, there are signs all over the beach saying, poison, shellfish, warning, do not eat. Because of, because of the chemicals and the toxins that are being put in the water because of the industry that's come onto our land. Um, and even during the time of um, when my dad was a kid my age and my group and Chichi were a kid my age, not only was the salmon their food, it was what they relied on to eat. It was free. The clams and the rockfish, just to name a few. And they always say when the tide is out, the table was set, because that's how pristine it was. The salmon runs there haven't been enough over the years, so every year there's a big truck that comes over with fish from um, fish from the I forget what it's called. <laughs> um, well, the fish that the band had purchased. And up to a few years ago, my chichi would freeze and smoke a year's worth of salmon for everyone. My Koopa would tell us stories where there was so much salmon, and there was a beach on our territory called Apokum, which means place of the maggot, and it was called that because the beach was just white, and it may sound disgusting, but it was white with maggots because of the, <laughs> it, because of the salmon, because there was so many salmon. And the same beaches, there was nothing. Our old traditional, you know, our traditional territory is called Tishosum, and that means place of the spawning herring. There are no more herring there anymore. So, you know, it's really what I'm afraid of couldn't happen to the rest of 
the coast. Um, the Northern Gateway Pipeline proposes to go along the Morris River. And they say that this is just a short river cleanup. But it's basically, it's a 300 mile journey all the way from Morris Lake to Port Edward at the mouth of the Skeena River. It starts at Morris Lake, and then the Morris River goes up, and then the Bulky, the Bulky River comes in, and then it becomes the Morris Bulky River. Eventually, the Skeena comes in, it becomes the Skeena River, and then it heads out into Port Edward. So it's not just a short pipeline cleanup, or a small section of a river cleanup. Environmentally, we're already swimming shoulder high in problems involving our Earth. When I researched Enbridge a few years ago, I found between the years of 2000 and 2010, Enbridge spilled 132,715 barrels of oil. Over 650 oil spills occurred between those 10 years. Granted the high possible chance of an oil spill disaster on our lakes, rivers, mountains, and communities, the risk is visible, and it's too visible to leave to luck and fate alone. Over the past two years, I've traveled to Bella Bella, and I've traveled to Hartley Bay and Kitimat, and I remember when I went up to the Hartley Bay area, I was staying at King Pacific Lodge, and so I went in a kayak and I went around the bend, and I remember just going into that bay and basically under the canoe, you couldn't even see the water because there was so much salmon. You know, I felt that I could just, you know, reach in, reach my hand in, and I could just grab one, but I didn't because I failed miserably. <laughs> I almost tipped over. But, you know, I just remember going along the path and just thinking, you know, I feel at home here. It's that feeling where you're outside and you're wet and you're dirty and you're cold, but that's okay because you feel at home. You're part of that nature. You feel safe and tranquil. And so half an hour later, I saw a spirit bear emerge from the bushes and I was sitting on top of this stump that had this corroded hill underneath it, which the stump was sort of leaning over the river. And the spirit bear, it came out of the bushes and it went right underneath that stump. And I remember just sitting there in awe, looking at that spirit bear three feet underneath me. I want to go back one day and see the spirit bears and the black bears that came out of those bushes and hunted for salmon the way my cats suddenly see a bird and run out the window. I want my great-great-grandchildren to be able to experience the same thing and practice slime and culture in a fluent way. That won't happen if the Northern Gateway Pipeline goes through. I was able to go to Hartley Bay and Bella Bella and see them just dry salmon off the rack. In Hartley Bay, it's not just, you know, once every spring, they go out in little camps and like, you know, we do and we practice our culture because of the restrictions. It's an everyday occurrence in these locations. It's a lifestyle. And it's amazing to see. Um, a legality that must not be ignored with this Northern Gateway Pipeline is the Royal Proclamation of 1763. If the Northern Gateway Pipeline, as proposed, would proceed as planned, it would be illegal, as stated under the, as sta as stated under the Royal Proclamation of 1763. This proclamation was the first law that both based and created Canada as a country. Um, in this proclamation, it states, unless a treaty selling the land to the king is made, um, our, us indigenous people have to present our consent to any corporation 
and the industrial proposal concerning our land. That's a treaty not been signed. And a majority of the First Nations communities crossed by this pipeline have not signed any treaties selling their lands, and a majority have already made their opposition clear to this proposal. Continuing the production of this pipeline, as I found, would be illegal to the law that faced the entire country of Canada. The continuation without the majority of our consent would be a violation to a national law. This roadblock is inevitably unavoidable. The Northern Gateway is so-called giving benefit to First Nations and communities. But however, what I want to talk about is benefit in the long term. And no, I'm not talking about the Northern Gateway Pipeline's misconception of long term, the weekly 20 years from now. I want to talk about how our world will look a century from now. Today, you sit in here, this human beings, as people who have jobs, they go to work, but sit at, down at the dinner table and you're a family. No, maybe you won't be around a century from now and you don't think that you have to worry about how to live in 2113, but we do. As I say, on our industrial road of destruction, we're in a car and we're heading off a cliff and the car is run on oil. And we keep seeing stop signs and turnaround signs and dead end signs and wrong way signs, but we don't listen. And eventually, on the road that we're heading, we're gonna hit that cliff and we're gonna fall. And there's no turning back then. Today, we worry about natural disasters, about insurance, about um, payday, as my dad calls it, Madagascar is being relieved. Um, but a century from now, the grandchildren of virtually everyone here might be living afraid of the world that we left for them. For one second, just for one second, just think as a family, put in those shoes a century from now. Think that you're living a century from now in the industrial future that we're heading to, and that you're afraid to go outside, and you're afraid that your kids are going to breathe that air, and they can get critically sick, that they can get cancer even for wanting to play outside. Today, we're afraid for our family because we care about our family. We worry about our family. A century from now, our great-great-grandchildren, you know, they might have more worries than we can ever imagine because of the world that we left for them. If your family put in those shoes at that time, wouldn't you wish that your ancestors had done something to stop it? And the thing is, we are their ancestors and we actually have a chance to change things, to change things for the people who will live in 2113. My recommendation for everyone in this room, think as people, not businessmen and women, but the great individual people and the families that you're a part of. What kind of world do you want to leave for your children? Um, I'm going to be singing Earth Revolution. And it's a song that I wrote with my singing teacher, Eileen De La Cruz, which is about what I said, is that we only have today, and we can't keep waiting for the tomorrows of the tomorrows. Still got a million miles to go, making a difference. The only truth.
trophy I want to hold the state of the nation it's poison from pollution greed and war we know we have solutions but actions speak louder than words oh stop waiting to
know, have been given a voice. And don't be afraid to speak up and use that voice. We were given a voice for a reason, to be the caretakers and the stewards. We are put on earth for this reason. How's the salmon supposed to tell you that it's dying? Or a whale supposed to tell you that it's going extinct? We have to use that voice for a reason. And speak up about what we are passionate about. Because the corporations and the companies that are mining and drilling and abusing the land that we call our home, they won't be here forever and they'll have to hand down the land that they've destroyed to the many generations to come. And the question is, what will they give the earth? What will they give us? So, you know, we actually have a chance to change the world that we will be living in. So let's not let that chance slip by. Everyone in, view, in this room has a gift. Share it. Thank you. like to say um, thank you. We're very happy and privileged to be here today. We enjoyed um, listening to Takaya's good words and her lovely, lovely voice. And if I was my sister, I'd sing for you, but I'm not, so I will just give a presentation. And we can do it to stop the screen because we're not getting our projector going. So. If you didn't know, Slavitan Nation, our in our Indian Reserve, is located on the north shore of Burrard Inlet. Um, Slavitan in our language means the people of the inlet. We're part of the Coast Salish culture area, which is really quite extensive. In fact, Slavitan First Nation is part of the Coast Salish. So we, while we don't share the same language, we share a lot of similarities in our culture, in our ceremony, in our historic um, tool of technology as well as all Coast Salish people lived in cedar plank shed style long houses alongside a, a body of water and our body of water is Burrard Inlet. And we're very, our people have lived in and along Burrard Inlet since time out of mind. Our numbers were up to 10,000 prior to the plagues that came along and decimated our population. We have been, just like what Takayo was saying earlier, that you know, Creator placed us here. Creator placed us here on our territory to take care of the land and water. We're actually these stewards in, in our way, in our snowia, in our law. It's our responsibility, it's our obligation. It's what we do, it's who we are, it's our sacred trust. And a while ago, an elder 
gave me a word in his language that meant sacred trust and it's shahalmas. And I use that word today because it, it just captures everything I need it to say. It's our sacred trust. Oh, here we go. It's, it, you probably can't see it in the back, so we'll just keep talking. So there's an interconnectedness between the health of our culture and the health of the environment. Like when we heard um, from Michelle earlier about what happened to them when the spill occurred in the Kalamazoo. We are healthy when our rivers, streams, beaches, and forests are healthy, and we were able to see from her presentation how unhealthy we can be when ca catastrophic things happen to our land and to our water. We're healthy when our communities are healthy. Um, the Slavic Nation made a decision there. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the legacy of all of the horrific things that have happened to First Nations people. That could be a whole nother well, that is a whole nother movement, and that's a whole nother lecture, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother evening. But we can say that Slavotip made a decision in the early 1990s that we weren't going to be paralyzed by fear or bitterness. That we wanted to put our Slavotip face back on the territory. We didn't want to be invisible in our own land. We wanted people to know who we are. And we wanted to see the environment restored to the way that it had been. And we, we knew that to do all of this, to fulfill our shahomas, our sacred trust, we need to find creative means and tools to move forward into the future, to make those changes. So we were doing all of that from like 1990, Five up until well, we're st we still do we still do that work. But in 2007, a spill occurred. Our community witnessed firsthand the environmental impacts of a Kinder Morgan oil spill in Burrard Inlet, when 1,500 barrels of oil spilled into Burrard Inlet and adjacent areas. We witnessed, as did all of you, because while well, the film crews were right there when it was happening and it was on the radio, and people who were just coming out of their homes on the North Shore could smell could smell the oil in the air. So we knew something terrible had happened. And we knew that there wasn't the emergency preparedness that there was supposed to be. And there wasn't an environmental management system in place to reduce the impact to the environment. And the monitoring of the long-term effects of the spill continue today. So the spill occurred on July 24th, 2007, approximately at 12 noon. A transfer pipe was breached by a road construction crew. And I have to tell you this, this morning I was in a big downtown hotel. We were at the Vancouver, we were at Fairmont Waterfront. It's a beautiful hotel. And we were there to hear about oil. But we weren't there to hear about oil in terms of how we're hearing about it this evening, in terms of oil spills and, and the impact and the devastation and all of the terrible things that are the legacy of oil spills in our environment. It was all about business. And I, and I must say, this is just, it's just totally polar opposite to what we're doing here this evening. And you are a much better looking crowd. You're <laughs> much nicer. <laughs> and it feels, you know, the energy in here feels pretty good. It was, it was, it was weird. It was just so, it was just so different because when they talked about talked about this, they made a point because it was the gentleman, it was the president, Ian Anderson from Kinder Morgan, who was actually one of the keynote speakers. So he was saying, and the one who introduced him made a point to say that it wasn't Kinder Morgan that you know punctured the pipeline. You know, they made sure to say it was a third party. You know, lots of the spills that happened occur because of third party interference or third party actions. <coughs> I'm sure those fish don't care <laughs> that it was a third party that made the spill occur. Anyway, so glad to be here this evening. Get some normal normalcy back in our lives. So a large portion of the oil entered the storm drainage system, so it had a really easy route to get right into right into the water. 
the oil was transferred into the to the Burrard Inlet because that system is, is an open system. This is a picture, and I know you're not going to see it very well, but it's a picture of where the oil spill went. So the oil spill happened on Wednesday. By the time we sat down to meet with Kinder Morgan to say pretty much what the hell, we had a map on the table and we showed them where the oil went and what of our resources it impacted. I'm sure it was the first time that they sat across the table from a First Nation that was that prepared. We have our own geographic information system in, in our office and we create all of our own maps and we've helped other First Nations create maps as well. So our technology is amazing and that we were able to put that on the table and say, this is what happened. And we had elders that could tell us where that oil was going to hit because the elders know how the tides are running. The elders know which way the water goes. And the elders know that because that's 10,000 years of knowing. 10,000 years of knowing is science. And we have to remember that. We have to remember that what our elders tell us isn't just an oral tradition, it isn't just an oral history, it's science, it's something. So our nation, as soon as it happened, within an hour, we had people on the ground in Burnaby, taking pictures actually of, of the devastation. We worked with collaboratively with um, Squamish Nation, Squamish Nation came and were on the ground with us as well. We worked with Kinder Morgan and all of the different agencies. It's kind of like a dog's breakfast. When you look at the different kinds of authorities that exist and who takes care of what, federal, provincial, municipal, um, you, then you're looking at different agencies like um, Port Metro Vancouver, um, Department of Fisheries and Oceans and, and Parks, Canada, and the list goes, the list goes on. So the nation was a member of the Incident Command Center, and we were part of the decision-making process, which is was important for us because it's our territory, and we would like to be part of that decision-making process. Our people have been here since time out of mind. So that's pretty much what I said. We wanted to emphasize to the agencies the involvement of the nation would build up the confidence in the cleanup efforts, um, like it was said earlier. Was it said earlier, or was I just thinking it? That sometimes you need to think about um, how clean is clean. No, I think Michelle said it. You know, if you're going to disturb it, is it going to create? Is it going to create more? Is it going to be more of a hazard if you stir it up again? So we needed to think about those kinds of things as well. Um, our critical concerns, assessment of the effectiveness of the containment of the oil spill, protection of the Burrard Inlet, the engagement and involvement of the Slaywood Nation, and the monitoring of the remediation. Well, the effectiveness wasn't too effective. And the protection was pretty much non-protection. It was, it was really, it was really awful for our community to witness it, but it was empowering for our community to be able to map it and to be able to be part of the, part of the going forward from there. We have um, social concerns, public notification, communications around the status of the spill um, in Wayawichin, Cates Park, and Belkara, uh, Tumtumokhtin, Barnett Marine Park, there are people swimming. And um, like we heard from Michelle, there were immediate, there were immediate health issues as well as short, medium, and long-term health issues. But none of this was getting communicated to the general public. In fact, it was our, it was our staff, Evan, right, that went into Kate's Park and told people, "You need to get those children out of the water." It was, it was crazy. Because there was a municipal strike at the time. I'm sure if there hadn't been a strike, it might have been different. So we won't crack on the municipality too hard. Ecological concerns, assessment of impact to the wildlife, assessment of impacts to fish and fish habitat, assessment of impacts to the marine habitat, assessment of impact to pink salmon, 
use of chemical detergents for cleanup, determination of the affected area, restoration, and monitoring. These are all the concerns that we have that we would like to see um, these issues taken care of. Cultural concerns, assessment of impacts to food collection areas, assessment of impact to significant wildlife areas, assessment of impacts to culture and archeological resources. I said in our community we have um, 10,000 years of knowledge, 10,000 years of knowing about our territory, about our, our water, about our land, about the resources that have been available to our people. Our old people used to say when the tide went out, the table was set. There were five different kinds of clams. There were oysters, there was squansai, there was squamish, which are sea urchin and sea onion. There were different kinds of salmon. Um, pink salmon was the biggest biggest run. In the old times, there was actually um, halibut. There were incredible amounts of resources. There were like six different kinds of ducks. Personally, I didn't know that there were six different kinds of ducks, but you don't want to eat the ones that eat only fish because, you know, they taste fishy. <laughs> so there were, all of, there were all of these resources available to our people, and because of urban sprawl, I mean, that's greatly diminished. What we have left is a fraction of what we had. We have constitutionally protected Section 35 Aboriginal rights. In the Constitution, highest law in the land. For Slaywood, it's all about the quality of that right. If I can't harvest, what is the point to that right? I think people are really understanding what Section 35 means and what it can mean to all of you who don't have that Section 35 right. Because we do, as First Nations, we have the opportunity to say to you, to Harper, um, excuse me, but you're infringing on my Section 35 right. And we need to be talking about this. There needs to be uh, a mechanism to work this out. Not everybody has that right, but First Nations do. It might be that the First Nations are the ones that are going to be able to stop this madness. Some of the impacts to our cultural resources, um, these were not considered. The responsible agencies were not present. It took five days of intense discussion. It took an additional two days to have resources in place to ensure that known and TWN known sites were considered during cleaning activities. A Section 12 site alteration permit was issued 13 days after cleanup activities commenced. Six years later, there have been 78 spills since 1951. Oh, another point from this morning. I think it was, where's Ben? I think it was Kinder Morgan. Wasn't it Kinder Morgan? He said, somebody asked the question, what's our, what's our cleanup rate? And he said, oh, I'm thinking 80 to 90%. And we're sitting there like, are you kidding me? And nobody in the audience said, you know what, are you sure about that, Mr. Anderson? It was amazing, and more. There was another lady, I can't remember where she was from, some, some other oil, the oil pipeline, I can't remember, so another lady. And she said, oh, excuse me, um, Ian, I think you spoke there, and probably you're, we're closer to 95. <laughs> <laughs> what world are they living in? Because they're not living in our world. So the largest of these spills have taken place since Kinder Morgan took over the line in 2005. Um, Kinder Morgan didn't own it until 2005, and it was owned by Trans Mountain, it's the Trans Mountain Pipeline. So in January 2012, Kinder Morgan Sumas Tink Tank Farm, a spill of approximately 90,000 liters of crude oil occurred at Kinder Morgan's Tank Farm in Abbotsford, BC. The National Energy Board's report showed that Kinder Morgan's ignored warning alarms for three and a half hours before responding to a gasket failure that resulted in the crude oil spill. It took six hours for an operator to arrive on the scene. The potential for human error is enormous. And it's 
And that actually will get driven home even further when there are tankers in Bart in that. Like we see 30 to 70 per year currently. Well, we're probably gonna say, see 10 times that many. And you know, remember the ferry coming out of, was it Rupert? Hitting a, an island and, and sinking. I mean, that, I, well, they're in court right now, so I'm not gonna say it's human error, but the potential for human error, error is enormous. <coughs> April 12th, 2012, Kinder Morgan announced that they will be proceeding with their proposal to expand the Trans Mountain Pipeline system. Actually, today, he was calling it the project. It wasn't the proposed project, it was our project and the project. Kinder Morgan announced it wanted to increase pipeline capacity from 300,000 to 750,000 barrels per day. They recently increased that capacity projection to 890,000. This could mean between, like I just said, 300 to 360 tankers per year compared to the 30 to 70 per year that currently enter Burrard Inlet. So it will increase five times as many. And this is a map that we made up on the Trans Mountain pipeline and where, it, and where it ends. We're deeply concerned about the changes to the federal government legislation. We know that the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act has been dramatically changed. We know that the Fisheries Act has been gutted. And, and we know that that's gonna affect, affect projects going forward. Kinder Morgan's is a proposed, it is a proposal, it's a proposed project. It's not underway like Enbridge where they're having joint review panels and well, Michelle was just at the joint review panel um, yesterday, I think, and, and presenting. Well, because Bill C-38 is already law, it's, it might well be that there isn't a joint review panel. There, there are gonna be, less obstacles in the way for Kinder Morgan than there were in, in, well, such as they are, in the way for Enbridge today. And we've learned that the federal government announcement to close key Coast Guard offices along the coast and BC's regional office for emergency oil spill responders located in Vancouver. And we're gonna have like three, well, there's potential to have 300 tankers, but you know, we sh they're thinking, well, we should probably take those oil respond responders out of for an imminent and don't let's have any key Coast Guard offices. We find, as I'm sure you will agree, that these decisions are unacceptable in the face of Kinder Morgan's proposed expansion. must oppose. The risk associated with Kinder Morgan's expansion project is, and we quote our chief, too great a risk for the nation to accept. As the people in the inlet, Slaughter Nation will oppose this project. Slaughter Nation will protect our rights. And Slaughter Nation looks forward to all of you standing with us when that day comes. I
which is in northern Alberta. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Coast Salish, Coast Salish territories that we're on, and thank you for allowing us into their territory. Um, looks like they're just pulling up this projector again. Projector problem. Um, but the first slide that I actually wanted to show you was, since coming from Alberta, I also work as a climate and energy campaigner with Greenpeace Canada. And um, it's been a number of years. I started doing my research in environmental studies, um, my master's in environmental studies, and started researching tar sands full time a number of about five years ago. And when I realized how much it was expanding, you know, we had heard about it in the 90s about it, you know people that we knew used to go work on the rigs is what they called it. They didn't call it tar sands. They didn't call it oil sands. There was no discussion about how. We were switching from unconventional to, or from conventional to unconventional sources like the tar sands, and how that was just in the 90s just kind of took off. And you know, we've had people that had passed away in, in, on the rigs, you know, people that I knew. And, and when I realized into the 2000s how much that it was just taking over, you know, the territories, I grew up with a sign um, to Little Buffalo where I was born um, that said Little Buffalo this way and also said oil sands in situ project this way, you know, so it was something that was always in our forethought since I was a child, um, but it was something that uh, people weren't discussing um, in Alberta, but also nationally, um, you know, as, a, as people across the lands, and so I think that's really important when we see events like today, um, and that discussion is happening now, because when we started this work even five years ago, no one even knew what tar sands was. People said, tar sands and Jane? What are you talking about tar sand? Like, they thought I was talking about a movie. So it's really nice to see, you know, like most everyone in this room knows what tar sands is now, and it's just, and I think that's a little bit of why, is it a little bit dark still, but um, did you brighten it a bit? Okay. So we're going to try to brighten it just so you guys can see the picture. So I'm going to talk a bit about tar sands first and then talk about the pipeline just to connect it back to, for people that maybe don't have um, kind of the information from out that's coming out of Alberta, I know probably a lot of people are in the know here, but there's also some some young folks here that um, I think would um, really benefit from hearing a little Tar Sands 101 that I'll go quickly over. Um, so, has everybody seen this picture? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Tar Sands unconventional. It's not free flowing. It's not something that you know we think of as you know something that comes from Saudi Arabia, it comes from Canada, um, other parts of Canada, it's something that is, you know, really uh, a different and destructive, more energy, more water, more carbon emissions, more toxic byproduct, more of everything. So here's the map. Um, I was born... There we go. born right here in the Peace River region. So there's three different deposit areas in Alberta. Um, so the Peace, the Athabasca, the Boom Town of Fort McMurray, and um, Cold Lake region. So that is approximately Eng England and Wales combined. So when they get, it's all said and done, they'll destroy you know, the size of the state of Florida or England and Eng Wales combined 141,000 square kilometers. So the mines, so I'm gonna show you the two different extractions really quickly. Um, the mines, these, you guys see this little yellow here? That's the biggest dump truck in the world, so actually bigger than the ceiling. Probably as big, maybe. Um, they're really big dump trucks, and they go about scraping the bottom of the forest. So this used to be pristine boreal forest. I talked to elders that had trap mines in these regions, um, places that you know people would harvest medicines, and now they're mines. And so they scrape down 100 meters down and scrape out the earth, and that's one of the ways in which they get tar sands. The other way is in situ or Seg D, which is where um, the community of Cold Lake in the Peace region. And so what they do is superheat steam, inject into the earth's core, boil the bitumen or the tar sands, and suck it back up. And so this completely fragments the forest, which is very problematic because by 2040 we'll see the caribou extirpated from tar sands regions because of projects like these. There's already 95 of in situ or Seg D projects on in Alberta, and there's about six mines, which are you know, as big as entire cities, each of them. Um, so this small community that I come from is just a little anecdote of what's happened to a lot of Native communities up north in Alberta. This is my dad when he was five. Um, he grew up in the bush. He was, you know, very, we were very isolated, even into um, when I was a young person, there was still no paper roads. 
Um, so I, you know, went on the horse and wagon with my kokum and Muslim. Um, it was something where I, you know, with what Takaya talks about of being able to see the land in a certain way, and that's embedded in my memory of, um, and it, it really played a big role on why I do the work I do today because it's changed so drastically. Um, this is my dad, and that's me where I was born beside the Peace River, and that's the Boreal Forest, which is one of the most ancient forests in the world, and it's being um, destroyed at an unparalleled rate other than the rainforest in the Amazon because of tar sands extraction. Um, so one of the communities you know, that w in the north were surrounded by development currently, and what we see already in the territory that I'm from is 2006 oil and gas wells um, already taking up, lease leasing out 70% of our territory um, without the consent of the people a lot of the time, and 1,400 square kilometers of tar sands, and then possible plans for nuclear development to fuel the tar sands in Alberta. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've seen since before I was born, or over $14 billion have been taken out of the traditional territory and revenue and resources, but my family is one of the families um, in the communities in Alberta that doesn't have running water. So we see this vast discrepancy of the way that communities are living and the resources and, ter and, and the resources that are taken out of our territories, but yet the resources that don't come back into the communities, and that's very problematic and very symptomatic of of these types of issues. Um, so you can see a satellite image of the '70s of tar sands um, before tar sands happened. This is the community where my family lives. It's a little teardrop they call it, and this is 70% um, of potential future development in Lubicon territory. This mapping was done by Amnesty International, um, and so what we're seeing in Alberta because of tar sands and oil is health concerns, respiratory illnesses, elevated rates of cancers, um, because of institute projects like this, the Shell plant, um, not too far from where I was born, um, that's been there for almost 30 years. And um, it just, you know, excretes poisonous gas, so there's issues with that as well. Um, water issues, which is a major problem with the Athabas Athabasca Glacier feeding the tar sands. Pristine water, we see the water receding thanks to climate change, and we see that even more so that, with, that this was from 1983, so we see this is very problematic. And I like to call these, this is a tailing pond, and this is literally an oil spill on land. Um, and actually, the tailing ponds right now take up 180 square kilometers in northern Alberta, which is the byproduct of extracting tar sands. So that's actually bigger than the city of Vancouver. Um, much bigger, actually. The city of Vancouver is 114 square kilometers, and there, and every day, you know, millions of liters are produced from tar sand extractions because it produces about one point. We pr produce Alberta, Alberta about 1.7 million liters a day, and um, what is being the byproduct is that you actually produce 1.5 barrels of toxic byproduct for one barrel of tar sands oil that's produced every day in the tar sands. So, as you can imagine, these tailing ponds, which actually look like lakes, are um, very toxic, they have arsenic, cyanide, mercury, lead, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, nymphenic acids, um, and this is leaching into the water, and this is why we see elevated cancer, cancers in the region as well. You can see a little bit closer up, it looks like an oil spill, so that's taken from the air, and you can see the pipe just spewing it out. So, there's no wonder why they call it dirty oil. And so what we're seeing in the north in Alberta is what we call cultural and environmental genocide because there's further encroachment in our land, there's contamination, there's destruction of our territories, which is resulting in um, the loss of traditions, customs, and culture. You know, sorry for the vegetarians out there. I'm, this is me making dry meat. It's a very long, old tradition. It's so good, though, and I'm very sorry. I don't mean to <laughs> offend people, but it's very good. It's very healthy um, for you, and it's, my dad's a hunter. You know, there's. Um, making dry fish, um, having we had we have cultural camps still on the land, and what we this is being replaced by is landscapes like this, where we see industrialized landscapes, polluted, drained watersheds, pipeline. This is actually a Trans Canada pipeline construction of the North Central Corridor uh, that was built across the Wakan territory without the consent of the people. Letters were sent to the company, letters sent to the government of Alberta and Canada, and they still built it without the consent of the. If, of the people that actually live there. Um, you can see flaring that happens. I was taken in Lubacan territory, and this is taken from the Athabasca, from one of the mines. 
And so you can see, um, you know, what's happening is that a lot of land is being moved, a lot of um, the land is being destroyed. Um, I really like this, for people to really understand what's happening in the tar sands is, since operations began, tar sands extractors have moved more than 1.4 billion tons of what industry calls overburden, which is actually the pristine boreal forest. <laughs> yeah, this they call it overburden, just to distance themselves from the fact of what they're actually destroying. And this is more dirt than was removed of the Great Wall of China, the Suez Canal, the Great Pyramid of Cheops, and the 10 largest dams in the world combined. So this is already the amount of land that's been taken out of the territory for tar sands. And like I was saying, we won't see the woodland caribou in our regions anymore after 2040 is what researchers are saying. Um, and this is very you know, problematic. It's actually a violation of Section 35, a violation of Aboriginal and treaty rights because we can no longer even practice these rights which are the foundation of Canada, um, which were signed in treaty. And then on top of all of this, um, then we're also seeing things like this, which is the massive pipeline spill that happened um, in our traditional territory, about seven kilometers away from where my family lives and has their homes. Um, so you can actually see how big it is, because this is a person right there, a little white person object. Um, so this was 4.5 million liters. Um, Kalamazoo is about three million liters. Um, and it's, it was 28,000 barrels, so it was massive. And there was no information given to the community the day of. The school was eventually closed down because people were feeling so ill that they couldn't, um, their eyes were burning, um, they had headaches, um, they were nauseous, um, there was a lot of issues that were um, kind of coming through text messages to me because my family, my auntie who's a teacher and has taught Cree in the community for 30 years, thank you, um, was texting me and saying, we don't know what is happening, we can't breathe, our eyes are burning, can you find out? Um, we had to shut down the school um, the other day, and we still don't have any answers. And this was five days before the federal election in 2011, so April 29th. So this is two weeks later when we finally got on site. Um, my family, my sister, different people in our communities were trying to clean up. Um, you can see them skimming. Uh, the, the land, but this is actually what, what this space right here is actually muskeg or peatland moss as they call it and that's actually where a lot of the oil went into it just kind of it's like a sponge right so it got soaked up and it was just like completely soaked up so they skimmed it for a number of months and then eventually had to dig it out kind of like they did with the Kalamazoo um, and this is uh, another flyover picture um, so folks there this is all the muskeg and all the oil throughout there um, it was really hard, too, to get even a helicopter to fly over because the company told the um, helicopter companies don't fly any environmentalists, don't fly any media, because they didn't want these pictures to get out. And so it was really frustrating when we found out how massive this was. I was calling around frantically to every helicopter company saying, please fly us over. And I had people literally hanging up on me or giving me crap for you know, working with Greenpeace or being an environmentalist and you know, not, not about like, oh my god, your family lives there or anything like that. It was more like, oh no, we're not flying you, sorry. And so we eventually got someone to fly over that one worked in forestry so he didn't feel as threatened because most people have contracts with the oil and gas there. So um, this is how these pictures finally came out. Um, and so one of the things that I was researching and I got this from a doctor out of Edmonton and I was just, you know, these are the symptoms, what's happening. Um, and so some of the volatile organic compounds that are released, especially after 24 hours of the spill, is like isobutenes and hexenes, and these cause the like burning eyes sensation, the nauseous, potential unconsciousness, um, these types of things that, are ha that were happening to my family that we also heard happen in Michigan, um, and I'm sure probably um, out in, by Burnaby. So um, the major issue was, and I've, that I've definitely seen a lot very common, is that there's no emergency response plans most of the time. And that was, I think, probably the most frustrating thing of the whole situation. And because First Nations fall under federal um, jurisdiction a lot of the times, so that's, you know, so that we see this thing between the Alberta government giving out these permits to allow these companies to have all these projects in our territories, but yet when it comes down to an emergency response plan, 
their hand their hands were off, even though um, you know they said otherwise, which was really frustrating. When we actually had Alberta Environment come into the community six days later after this bill and said, when we because we sent we sent out a press release, so I agree with the media sometimes being very helpful because then finally the issue is being exposed because no one was talking about it before the federal election. It was definitely hush hush, and so finally we had all you know media come out. But the frustrating thing was, um, and I think the most, yeah, it was really frustrating because she was sent here to basically say, we've been here on site since day one. She literally said that. And I was appalled because, you know, no one had seen them, no one had heard from them, no one had talked to them. The only thing that the community received five days after this bill was a one page fact sheet about, oh, FYI, by the way, Biggest oil, one of the biggest oil spills in Alberta's history is right beside you. Sorry, we didn't tell you sooner. Um, and so that was shocking and it was frustrating even more so when she finally came and was trying to basically talk to media, Not didn't come into the school, didn't talk to the leadership, just stood in front of media, the cameras, and said, yes, um, we've been here since day one. And I had already spoken to all these different media folks and they were pretty shocked because like where, you know, where, what kind of information can we get? And we were just basically trying to give them what we had found out. And so finally they, they showed up with their one page fact sheet and, and I asked the media, I, I just said, can I ask her a couple of questions? Because this is the first time we've been able to talk to her. And they're like, yeah, yeah, by all means. And so I said, well, when you are talking about you've been on site since day one, where have you been? Because we haven't actually seen you. You've you know, been on site in the oil spill, maybe, but you haven't been here because no one has seen you. And so then, you know, things like that where it's just, it's so frustrating to have to deal with people that aren't actually treating your family or the community with any dignity. And that is so frustrating. Um, and that's something that I really hope that if the Kinder Morgan spills again or the Enbridge was spilled and that was spilled that communities wouldn't have to go through something like that. Because it's, it's something that I still don't think that I've ever actually completely gotten over yet. Um, and then, 15 months later, then we, when we finally went back on site to, you know, when this, the snow had melted, and um, we, we wanted to see what was happening, you know, because people were like, we're not going back there, we haven't gone hunting, you know, it's just really hard to access, so I asked one of the counselors to take me back there again. Um, and he said, okay, and so we went back, I luckily had a photographer with me, and this is what we found after you know months of looking at the website of the oil company the, of All Plains America that was said reclamation's been under underway. You know we fully re reclaimed the area. We're just restoring it now, and you know every month they put an update with nice nice pictures with some green vegetation popping up. And I was like, okay, well then hopefully that's what it looks like when we get there. And you know, so the, the one side it looked a little bit better. There was vegetation. There was some, you know, there was still kind of like oil sheen on the top of the water. But at least there was like, you know, the elders say with like the little bugs. At least that means there's a little bit of life. And then we crossed the corridor because of when the oil spilled, it, it spilled on both sides of the corridor of where that pipeline is. And then this side though was the side that they had to completely dig out. But I guess like. Michelle was saying they just didn't dig deep enough. And so this is what we found on the other side of the corridor. You can see that it's just black goo, sludge. There was no life whatsoever, no signs of any life, no bugs. Um, you know, we, and the stench was just really appalling too. And, and it smelled like oil. And it was just a big, massive pool. Um, we took some water samples and it was just, it was really surprising that, of course, that wasn't what was on the website. That wasn't what was given to the public. And so, you know, of course, this issue has been forgotten about and, you know, people are moving on. And, of course, the government wants them to do that, um, or the company especially. But that's, you know, not how our family is able to move on because you can't hunt in these areas. You can't utilize the land in the ways that in which we would. People can't, you know, camp out there um, we, see, we actually saw on the other side of the pond like just animal tracks and so it's kind of worrisome that you know wolves are maybe i really hope that they're not drinking out of this and that's the kind of you know long-term issues that happen um to communities because you know once the cameras are gone um once you know the dog's breakfast is 
um, Le Leah called it. They're gone. They're, you know, this is this is what's left. So um, I think that's something that's really important for communities that have to be on watch now, um, because the thing, the similarities between Kinder Morgan and the All Plains pipeline was that it was past 40 years. It's more than 40 years old, so an old pipeline, an aging pipeline. It was a multi-use pipeline, so that means it carried tar sands, it carried sweet light crude, it carried um, diluent, um, so they put they, they carried all sorts. And so that means that there's potentially more corrosion because the tar sands is more corrosive, has more sulfur content. Um, so that's the type of issues that um, are worrisome for communities along aging infrastructures, for pipelines as well. Um, and so yeah, so here we are, BC, um, and we've been working a lot with communities out here um, uh, that oppose Kinder Morgan, the Yinka Dene Alliance um, in the north, and have been in touch with, also with the Squamish and the Slay Tooth. I just actually came today from speaking with Stolo and Chiam because they're along, out in Chilliwack, they're along the pipeline. Um, just kind of sharing the stories of kind of what, you know, this is, this is the Michigan one, and uh, what could potentially happen, and that's what the scary thing is. And so I'll end it on a positive note. Um, for anyone in here that feels so inclined to ever come visit the Tar Sands, we have every year a healing walk. Um, this year will be in July, it's the fourth annual healing walk. We have people that come, we've had people come from BC, we've had people from Ontario, the States, across the pond in Europe. Um, so it's open to kind of, if you want to come walk with us and walk with us in prayer, um, I extend that inv invitation to you right now. Hi, hi, thank you very much.
closing Coast Guard stations, the federal government closed down environmental protection offices. And to, just today, Lynn Perrin was at the Fraser Coastal Health uh, board meeting, and uh, she asked about preparedness for spills, and this is the board of Fraser Health Region. An eminent doctor responded, they've cut us back and I'm really worried. This is the provincial government. Um, it just leaves me wondering, in, in, in some trepidation, what can we do? We force them to prepare and or prepare your citizenship to handle it. Um, the year after the spill, none of our first responders went to the social so-called training that is put on by the oil and gas industry. The year after a 1.1 million spill, no one from our area went to the training. Probably because they were ill, but that might just be an educated guess. You have to be prepared yourself. I no longer rely on my government. And I've seen that over and over again. I don't know about Worse. Um, but but you know, that's what we're seeing. It's when there's a technological disaster, you're in trouble, and that's what this is. And I mean, I heard her force them by gathering your community and saying, "No, if you're going to put this through here, you're going to train people, and we're going to have a, a a proper way to take care of our citizens." That's my humble opinion. <laughs> when um, we had met with Kinder Morgan after our oil, that oil spill in Burnaby in 2007, we had, in part of those discussions, we had suggested to Kinder Morgan that we train First Nations to be first responders because we are we're right there. And we thought that would be a great idea, although that wasn't anything that came to pass with Kinder Morgan. However, today, while we were listening to Ian Anderson's keynote this morning, that was actually one of his ideas that we trained First, First Nations to be first responders. I think that's what we need We need to do, it, and um, I think that Slaywater Nation will likely find a way to do that kind of work. I don't know how, but I think that's important something that we need to do and it's something that collectively we need to be one voice saying to our governments that with these impending risks we need better protection what we are seeing with the cutbacks is unacceptable and if we could get everybody saying did any of the children go to We Day with their young people? So the two guys were talking about how you could break a pencil by itself, two pencils a little bit harder. Pretty soon he had 15 pencils and he couldn't break them in half. And that's what he was saying to the young people. That's what you need to be. You need to be 15 <coughs> pencils. So that's what we need to be. <laughs> I agree that we need first responders, but the thing that scared me the most was knowing that my family was out there helping the cleanup and putting their own health at risk. Because they had to have the PPT, they had to have the protective gear on, but you know, I, I talked to my cousin's husband or like people that wanted to take it off because they're, they're cleaning for 12 hours, you know, and they have to have this mask on that time and people, I know for a fact people took it off because they get claustrophobic and it's just like what were they breathing in and that that also worries me because our communities are gonna are gonna be there and exposed to this but they're also going to be there probably cleaning up and that's worrisome for me if these projects continue to expand <coughs> So we'll go for another question in a second. But just another thing on that, though, I don't think there, no one invests in oil spill cleanup technology. So uh, you heard the president of Kinder Morgan today say some astronomical number, but you know we know only about 15% of oil uh, actually gets recuperated, and that's considered a success. And tar sands, we know, is different uh, as the Kalamazoo 
uh, experience in particular shows. So uh, you know, the technology is not getting any better. It's it, it really would be people out there with buckets and sponges and the rest of it. So I'll take a question from the fellow there. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for your wonderful talks. And I think we're among friends here. What I want to ask is, like, we've seen that profits are what matters. The Section 25 doesn't matter. Treaty rights don't matter. They'll do whatever they want. So I'm going to ask the speakers, what more can we do? What can we do to think about this law? Because we have this crisis coming at us. And I'm wondering, uh, what can we do to do this? election coming up yeah. and I think you need to go to the NDP because well if you listen to the polls that could be the next uh, provincial government you need to press the NDP and say what does this mean what what would you do about Kinder Morgan what would you do about all of these all of these um, cutbacks and shutdowns that are happening around the protection that exists current or existed currently for for the Burrard Inlet. I think we need to vote with our feet. We need to go where we think we can get the best help. And I think we need to support um, the mayor, Gregor Robertson, who has said that he doesn't want to see the city of Vancouver become this great big oil port. And it isn't just oil that we need to be worried about. Um, last week, I understand that Port Metro of Vancouver approved the expansion for the Neptune Terminal. It's a coal facility in North Vancouver. They um, approved an, a potential expansion that would double it in size. I understand there's an additional application in the Surrey Fraser Port to create a, a new coal facility. <coughs> If that project gets approved, along with the expansion, Vancouver will be the largest coal exporting city port in North America. Is that what we want to be? So we need to be turning to our municipal governments. We need to be supporting the ones who are supporting um, the values that you hold. We need to be pressing our provincial governments and heck, I don't know what to do about the federal government. <laughs> um, I think it's a multi-pronged approach, you know, it is, it is about, in Alberta, what we see is actually First Nations uh, challenging the Alberta and federal government, as well as the companies, so there's legal means in which they're doing that uh, for Bill C-35 and um, 38 and 45, but also Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. But it's also, you know, people educating themselves, people educating each other, their families, um, teachers. I, you know, I've seen a lot of different things over the past number of years. Um, speaking with media, we've dealt with investors, um, you know, giving them tours in the tar sands where they realize that's not eth actually um, ethical. You know, so we see these things um, happening. Um, we see the Keystone XL where people are actually using their bodies, you know, outside of the White House and they're protesting. Um, we've seen that in Ottawa in Parliament, um, we saw that last year at the Bender Coast. Um, so I've, I've, I guess I've, I've seen a lot of it because it's something that I've been doing for the past number of years, but I've seen more and more people every year, like yourselves, at those events, and I think that shows the people power. Um, and it's, it's a, it's, it is about our vote, and it's also about the people power on the streets, you know, and I don't know more. or it's for the Great Bear Rainforest. You know, there's, I mean, there's so many different issues and frankly, pipelines aren't job creators. And, uh, um, you know, which, which sort of works, I mean, economically it works in our favor <laughs> with that argument as well. And I think, so one of the benefits of people being able to have all these various entry points is that it's really built bridges and being in a community, um, I live in Smithers, and there's seen amazing you know, bridges built between First Nations and non-First Nations community, between rednecks and hippies, you know, young and old. It's like 
So it's really great, and it's sort of, too, then it's like, how do we also take that energy and, you know, start building, you know, the kind of economies that support us and that we want to see. So, question. Take a question there. Yeah. Um, uh, I first heard the word oil sands in 1968. Two years later, it became tar sands. And when I heard that, I thought, whoa, how did we go from oil out of sand to oil being made out of tar? I also did a lot of research for the U.S. government in uh, reading oil and gas reports for two years. Not a nice issue to deal with. I've also worked on the pipeline for two years in northern Alberta. Uh, actually, all over Alberta. Uh, now I've seen oil bends, oil spills, gas bends, gas spills. But you know what the real problem is? It's not pipeline problem, it's people problem. And it's the people on this planet. How do we stop? How do we stop the thirst for oil and gas? Thirst for oil, gas, water, and our resources. How do we stop that? There's a whole nation across the water that's thirsty for our oil, gas, water, and resources. How do we stop that? Thank you for your question. I'm just asking, how do we stop it? I, want, I would just want an answer to that. Education. Mm -hmm. Education, and if you have to do it one person at a time. Um, <laughs> I'm from the US, you know. We're big gas hogs. I've spent two and a half days in your beautiful city. You got electric cars. The other night I rode in a car that was part of a uh, co-op. Not one. What is that? These people are smart. It's an education. I'll take that back and I'm going to say to some of my friends, you know what, if a whole bunch of us get together and we put an electric car. I'm from Michigan. You know, <laughs> they like their cars there, and they like them to spend oil. Um, but we can learn, and so you educate. And that's one of the reasons why I came here. I wanted to learn from these guys and from you guys. So you educate one at a time if you have to. Um, in, is it May? April. April, at the Wall Center, what were the days? April 18th and 19th, Slouch Nation has joined up with um, the city of Vancouver and Burnaby, and we're putting on a conference called um, Transitioning from Oil Dependency. So we'll be looking at um, alternative forms of energy, and you know, that's the education that we're talking about, so hope to see you there. and we stopped that from making our voices heard. We made a lot of noise. It wasn't really a big issue down here, but on the North Coast it was, and we stopped it. So with that in mind, we're holding casseroles. We're trying to hold them every month. Uh, the next one is gonna be tomorrow at uh, the Art Gallery, and we're gonna march up to the uh, Wall Center and bid uh, the uh, joint review panel at you. And good riddance. <laughs> Um, but my question is like, um, when they say it's a million barrels, who, who determines this? Who's giving you these numbers? Because we saw that in the Gulf of Mexico, that BP did their very best to, uh, you know, to lowball it. Uh, and, and also it asked about dispersants if they were also used in your communities. Um, on the amount, the 1.1, is from the EPA up to date. Enbridge says it was 847,000. If you talk to the citizens that live along the river, we expect at the end of this, it will be between 2.5 and 5 million gallons. And that's just an, a, an estimation from how long we've had people smelling it. So 
we know that they lie about the numbers. I mean, I did two and a half years ago, but that happens every single spell. So if you have a spell, take the number and jump it up, because you're going to have more. On the dispersants, they said no, but if you talk to the residents along the river, yes. Uh, you, they were dumping dump trucks of stuff into the river, and it wasn't safe. So what bubbles up, and um, I've, I've taken photos of the phone that has magically appeared in our river, and we've compared it to what's going on down in the Gulf. So we're pretty sure that dispersants were used. We don't know how much, but it was hidden. Yes, dispersants were used, and the numbers mm -hmm. for the 1500 came from the NEB. We didn't use dispersants because we were in a contained area, so it was, you know, it wasn't going right into the river like it was in the, uh, the other two. Um, but we also the numbers, same thing. We, the basically they shut it the the oil um, the pipeline three times because there was an emergency, like it shut itself down and the person turned it on three times. So it ran from 11 p.m. till 7 a.m. when they finally did their first flyover when they realized mm, maybe we should check out if there's something wrong by keep shutting itself off. So. I mean, that's why we got the 4.5 milliliter number, but who knows, right? It probably was higher. Okay, we'll take one last very brief question. Yeah. Okay, uh, a few years ago, I was going across the Lionsgate Bridge, and I'm, I'm from Port Alberni, by the way, and uh, I was talking to some uh, scientists there, biologists, and they said that most of the rivers in the uh, southeast in, in, in Asia, they throw everything in the rivers. So uh, there was a, a panel to discuss whether or not the coal from Fanny Bay going to going uh, out through Port Alberni to Asia was there a problem? And I brought up the idea. I only had three minutes and brought it up and say, well, look, uh, if you come back in ballast, where do you get your ballast water from? Is this okay water? And where do you dump it? And they didn't seem to know where you dumped it. Okay, so if you bring dirty water and bring it where do you dump it? Now, in 1965, there was a book I looked at. I opened this thing up yesterday. It was kind of fortuitous. And I thought, oh, they're dumping the ballast under the Lionsgate Bridge. And where are we dumping it now? That was, you know, some, some, lots of experts around here. And they can probably check it out and say, where are they dumping it? How many tons would be, you know, the, there's lumber boats or log boats. There's, and they all come in at ballast because they don't want to be completely empty. Otherwise, they get bounced around and they can't keep. The, the ship going the right way. So the question is, how many tons of ballast are we dumping on a regular basis and then add that about the oil and figure out what, is it dirty ballast or not? Anyway, that's a, a subsidiary idea, but anyway. I don't know if anyone here can answer that question without well, ballast, but I know it. Well, find your tanker expert. Yeah, that'd be good. A freighter expert. Um, so to wrap up, just a few things. One is, uh, please everyone sign a postcard if you haven't already that was sitting on your chair and give it back to one of the volunteers. <laughs> Uh, there's some pens over there. Um, this Saturday is not the vote. Um, so just reiterating that one of the important actions uh, for you to take is to go out and vote and to ask questions at all candidates' debates and see where candidates stand and try to push them uh, a little bit further uh, than maybe they've, the position they've taken. And so uh, we'll just get Joel in here to explain what that is. So since, since Harper changed the rules, um, this is ultimately going to be a political decision one way or the other. And so one of the most important ways we can influence it is by taking to the streets and talking to voters. So this Saturday, um, starting at 10.30, we're meeting at the Ukrainian Orthodox Center that's just down there on 10th. Um, if you're looking for the address, there's flyers at the back and a sign-up sheet where you can sign up. And we're going to be going door knocking in this riding, talking to voters. This is going to be a key riding in the upcoming provincial election. And so we're going to be letting voters know about this issue, telling them where the parties stand, and urging them to push all the parties to take strong positions. We don't think this should be a left or right issue. We want all parties to come out and, and advocate for for clean water and an oil-free coast. So um, it's, it's going to be super simple. It'll take a couple hours of your time. We'll do a quick training beforehand. Um, just meet up at the Ukrainian Orthodox Center at 10.30 on Saturday. We'll split you into pairs, do a training, make sure you're comfortable, and then we're going door knocking. Um, and then following that, there's going to be a little celebration 
um, at Steamworks Pub. So hope all you can make it. Um, I'll be lingering down at the table with the sign-up sheets, and if you have any more questions about it, I'm happy to sign you up and, and answer any questions you have. Knock them out. Thank you. I'd really like to thank uh, Katie Harrison and the volunteers who've helped out tonight, as well as uh, Melissa Rubino for all her organizing of the event, and Damian, who's with Chana Chanalakwai um, Productions, and uh, as well as Think First Productions for filming and live streaming our first event. So this. Uh, um, another thing that's always useful is to tell these stories from the heart, but you can also get people to tune in. It will be on our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash forest ethics. And, um, and last but definitely not least, I would really uh, like everyone to give another round of applause for these amazing speakers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, gets, it all gets busy. Yeah. yeah. But like, life is good.